I had the privilege of serving in the state legislature for 20 years, so I oh. can appreciate your, your effort as a lawmaker. And I appreciate the fact that you're having these town meetings. Uh, but the, during the time that I served, we had a great bipartisan situation in our state. We had two Democratic governors, one Republican governor. Generally, the House of Representatives and the Senate were a majority Republicans, but we had four sessions of Democrats. And as Scott Matheson used to say, we addressed, is it good public policy? So my request to you is to uh, work as well as you can with the other side. Uh, there are things that bipartisan work would help. The other concern that I have um, is uh, the comment that you made about the ruling class and preserving the, ru the ruling class. I don't know if you mean the ruling class of the government people or are the, my, my concern is very specifically of the billionaires who have so much money that they can put into campaigns I'm concerned about the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United that makes it possible for huge anonymous contributions to come in. And y you know the PACs that you work with too, the Americans for Prosperity, Carl Rove's uh, Citizens United or what, uh, whatever his group is called. But I don't want to see this country dominated by a clique of billionaires. Okay. Uh, thank you, Carl, and, and thank you for your service to our state in the, in the legislature. I still believe that the best government is that government which governs locally and at the state level. And you were part of a system that, by and large, works really well. Even though we can all point to things that we might wish were different, there's a much higher level of satisfaction with state and local government than there is with national government, in large part because we're doing too much through the national government. Yeah, I'm getting to that. Thank you, Carl. So, um, the ruling class consists first and foremost of those who are in office, uh, especially those who are in office in Congress. And those who are in office in Congress have, uh, in recent years, had a re-election rate of about 85%, which is really, really high. And it's in both parties and both houses of Congress that that is the case. People will stay there often for decades uh, in office. It's not just them, of course. You referred to billionaires. Oftentimes, the ruling class is propped up by billionaires. Uh, and this, this works in sort of a symbiotic relationship so as to perpetuate the ruling class. Uh, there are also people in the ruling class in the executive branch of government, uh, many of those who are federal regulators, who develop regulatory policy but never have to stand for election. And so there are those people who perpetuate government, who stay there for a really long time, and never go home. Those who believe Washington knows best. Um, with respect to Citizens United, we could have a, a, a lengthy constitutional question about that. Citizens United really did something far more simple than most people are willing to acknowledge. What it did was to say that, they're not, that the federal government can't treat differently a corporation that owns a media company uh, uh, from a, uh, a corporation that doesn't own a media company. Um, those in the former category could do whatever they wanted and were protected by the First Amendment in engaging political speech before the Citizens United decision and after both of them were able to do so and it was no longer a discriminatory policy. With regard to bipartisanship, I couldn't agree more that we need bipartisanship. I couldn't agree more that bipartisanship is a good thing. Uh, I engage in bipartisan efforts every single day. Almost none of them get reported in part because that isn't sexy. The, the, the reporters in Washington many of whom, by the way, fill the ranks of, of the political class. Um, uh, they help perpetuate big government. Uh, they don't like to report on bipartisanship because it's not fun. It's not interesting. It's not man bites dog. It's dog bites man, and it's not newsworthy, as many of them believe it. But I'm currently running a number of pieces of legislation with Democrats, many of them very liberal Democrats. My friends Ron Whiten uh, and Jeff Merkley and Pat Leahy can all attest to the fact that I'm running legislation with them uh, to promote things like the privacy of your email. Did you know, for example, your email loses its First Amendment protection? Not really its First Amendment protection, but its statutory protection that it ought to have. It loses its privacy after 180 days. This is a, a silly law that is the uh, vestigial remains of something enacted in 1986 that makes it so the government can read your email without a warrant just because it's 180 days old. 
Um, I've got other legislation that I'm uh, running with Democrats that tries to rein in the NSA to make it so the NSA would have to get a warrant before it can spy on you. Um, I do things with, with Democrats all the time, and, and it often results in good policy, but that often goes underreported. Uh, so sometimes the problem is when we don't reach across the aisle. Uh, sometimes the problem is when Washington can't reach a decision point. Sometimes the problem actually results from when we do reach a decision point, and when most members of Congress will jump in and vote for something just because everybody else is doing it. There was a tax bill that was passed just after midnight on New Year's, New Year's Day this year. Uh, it, it was a 153-page tax bill. It allowed taxes to go up. We received that bill by its authors at 1.36 a.m. on New Year's Eve. Exactly six minutes later, at 1.42 a.m., the bell rang, which meant it was time to vote on that bill. We still hadn't even had a chance to print it off. Ninety-eight senators engaged in a shameless act of passing that law without having read it. I'm proud to have been one of the eight, a bipartisan group, who said, no, I will not vote for it. Thank you. My name is Linda Anderson. I'm from Grantsville. And I want to know um, how we can get the Republican leadership and some of the maybe long-term members there to stand for core principles and clearly and cogently articulate conservative values and why they matter and follow the Constitution because I feel like they're not willing to engage in any kind of a disagreement with, excuse me, but the other side. Good. Thank you. First of all, it helps anytime when we can articulate these principles in terms of um, constitutional adherence. Um, sometimes what we think is necessarily a, a distinctively Republican or distinctively conservative issue may well just be an American issue. It's, it's neither Republican nor Democratic. It's just an American issue because it's rooted in our Constitution, which last I checked is still the law, which last I checked every member of Congress, all 535, 435 in the House and 100 in the Senate have taken an oath to uphold. So put it to them in those terms and tell them, uh, regardless of what your political views are, regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, I expect you to enforce the Constitution. That means, among other things, when your government is doing things that confirm all your worst fears about government, through things like uh, Benghazi, the IRS scandal, the NSA scandal, confirming all your worst fears that your government is lying to you and spying on you and targeting you, uh, tell them um, you, you don't have the constitutional authority to do that. When the President of the United States acts three times at least this year to amend the Affordable Care Act without going to Congress, uh, an act that doesn't give him that authority, uh, in the absence of any constitutional authority to do that, tell your member of Congress, stand up to that. And I don't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you've got an institutional and a constitutional imperative, an obligation, a duty to stand up for that when that happens. When you share these principles with your elected representatives, and you, when you share them with them in constitutional terms, very often they can relate to that. Very often that will be persuasive. Uh, some people think that the era of influence your, your senator or congressman with a phone call or a letter has passed. It hasn't. Uh, they really do listen. So let them know. And help spread the word to others and have them spread the word also. I would like to believe that because I've been to your office numerous times. And I have not had any response adequate. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the Glass-Steagall bill, which um, you said that you were for when you ran for office, that you were for that bill. You've been in office, you told us, three years. And you've done nothing about that bill. And um, right now, we have a situation here in the United States where we are in debt, $23 trillion because of the bailout scheme. Most people don't realize how bad it is, but and most people, you don't like the bailouts, but it's been an ongoing thing. And Glass-Steagall would undo that. We need it seriously, badly. And I've had people tell me, well, you know, the government is supposed to be um, not... Um, 
big, you know, but the government is supposed to be big enough to protect the people, okay? And, to, and our Constitution was put in place to protect us, to give us, a, a, to protect the general welfare of the people. And so I want to ask you, when are you going to do the right thing and uphold the Constitution and support the Glass-Steagall Bill? Okay, thank you. Okay, so Glass-Steagall, um, think of this as a provision to avoid bailouts. And we all, this, by the way, who agrees with me that we should not have more government bailouts of banks? I think everybody agrees. And I, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. And so the idea behind Glass-Steagall is to prevent a situation where uh, we might have further bailouts uh, through a, a by reinstating a provision of law that used to be in law that prevents the consolidation of commercial banking with investment banking. Uh, and I share the objective behind doing that. Um, I, I, I believe that we need to prevent other, other bailouts. In, in working with those who understand the banking system, especially as it's evolved in recent years, remember we've had about 2,000 pages worth of new bank uh, uh, reform in the Dodd-Frank Act a couple years ago, uh, largely a disaster uh, of, of a piece of legislation, but we've got a big overlay on top of that. On top of that, we've got the understanding that even with, um, even had Glass-Steagall been in place, uh, we still had, would have had failures by Bear Stearns and by Lehman Brothers. And so I'm, I'm not yet convinced that the same law that was enacted originally in the early 1930s would be the same one that would do it. I think it's close, but I'm trying to work through this. I'm not on the banking committee, but I've taken an interest in this anyway, and I share your concern. We're trying to find the, the right solution that takes into account the changing economic circumstances and the renewed economic and regulatory environment of our banking system so as to prevent more bailouts. There's, there's, well, there have been two reports been out, been out, and the Lehman report, and I think there's been a new report that says that, that Glass-Steagall would have prevented that. But that's a big problem, um, the, 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 the fact that um, it's not in the Send me a copy of those reports. I'd love to see them. Thank you. I've, I've already have. <laughs> okay. Hi, I was, um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on um, term limits in Congress. I um, support them. Okay, and also um, your thoughts on to restore the Senate back to the states. Yeah. Where the states delegates vote on the Senate instead of by popular vote, so they're so the Senate can be held more accountable to the states instead of the federal government. Okay, great. Let me address both questions in, thank you. With respect to the first part of the question, um, I think we need constitutional term limits uh, to help dismantle this perpetually um, entrenched polit political, uh, political ruling class. Uh, I think we ought to have a constitutional amendment that would limit members of Congress to uh, 12 years of service in either House of Congress. If you can't get it done in 12 years, then it's time for you to go home. Um, and, and I think that me needs to be applicable across the board. <laughs> the second part of your question deals with the 17th Amendment. Uh, it's been 100 years now since the 17th Amendment was ratified and took effect in the 17th Amendment. It changed the original structure of the Constitution uh, under which senators were chosen by the state legislatures and uh, made senators uh, subject to a popular election in each state. Um, I think that we lost something in the constitutional system uh, when we moved to that um, because we no longer had the Senate representing the state governments. We never, no longer had the states represented as states as selected uh, by their state legislatures. I don't think that the political will exists or is likely to exist in our lifetimes to undo it. I think that too much water has crossed under the political bridge. Um, I, I could be wrong on that, but that has been my impression. Senator Lee, my name is Richard. I want to thank you for coming tonight and being our senator. Um, the Constitution governs 
all Americans, including uh, everyone from the trash man on up to the President of the United States. I'd like to know when the Senate and the Congress is going to pursue action against the President of the United States for willfully violating the Constitution several times. Because, frankly, I'm tired of it, and I know a lot of other Americans are tired of it, too. It's, it's, he, he has disregard for the Constitution, and we need to rein him in. The branches are separate but equal. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Tell me your name again. Richard. Richard. Thank you, Richard, for your comment on that. Um, all right. Th there are several different ways that your comment could be taken. Um, how many think that the president violated the Constitution when he rewrote the Affordable Care Act at least three times this year? How many think that the president violated the Constitution when he sent us into an armed conflict type situation in Libya without getting Congress? How many think that it was odd that he uh, told us he didn't have time to consult us and that's why he didn't and yet he consulted the UN and yet he consulted the Arab League? How many are concerned about the NSA spying on you? How many are concerned about the IRS targeting you? Yeah, okay. And being over our health care. Okay, so, yeah, 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 that's a fair point. Um, we'll probably get to Fast and Furious later, but, um, uh, the, p the point is there are a number of situations in which the uh, president has played fast and loose, if not fast and furious, also with the Constitution. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. There are some ways that we can stop the president from doing what he's been trying to do. A lot of people in, in my political party right now are saying, well, just take him to court over his decision to amend Obamacare without uh, Congress. Um, I, I respectfully disagree that that is the best approach. Now, I, if somebody wants to try that, I say go nuts. Uh, good luck with it. Uh, have at it. Uh, good luck. I hope you win. I'm not sure that anybody's going to be able to establish standing uh, in, in federal court in order to sue him on that. I'm not sure that the courts will assume jurisdiction. Even if they do, I'm not sure that the court will be able to decide it in enough time because we've got a one-year window in which this litigation could begin. So in the case of his unconstitutional Obamacare amendments, uh, the only way to stop him, the only surefire way to stop him that I know of is for Congress to say, Mr. President, you're not going to follow Obamacare. We're not going to fund it. Yeah. And this, it turns out, is the, is the best way in most circumstances for us to respond to an unconstitutional encroachment by the President. Um, because if he knows that we're going to defund his programs whenever he does something unconstitutional, he's going to stop it. My, my, my point, though, was like about the two federal judges that, that ruled that he violated the Constitution during the congressional recess, that wasn't really a recess. So that was the point. Yeah. That, that's the main point. The Obamacare is secondary to that. I mean, he How can I forget that one? Oh, you, 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 <laughs> how many think that one was unconstitutional? Uh, recess appointments were not a recess. Yeah, yeah thank you. So yeah, that's a, yet another circumstance. Now, I, I was, uh, I, I was uh, broadly criticized by the ruling elite in Washington and by the press because I started voting against his judicial nominees after he did that because my point was that everything he does that's unconstitutional warrants some kind of a response by us. That was the only thing I could think of that would get his attention, and it did. And he focused on beating me up in one of his weekly radio addresses. And then the, the media, locally and nationally, dutifully complied and insisted him in beating me up over it. And yet, I felt pretty darn smug when that federal court concluded that he had violated the Constitution. I'm Milton Hartman. I'm from Ibapah. And I'm representing the historical society of that area. And I want to thank you for sending two of your constituents up there to look at what the BLM have done. In 1993, the Supreme Court of the United States, and I did give this a copy to your, your folks that came out, said that the BLM must, by law, 
work with the state of Utah and or Tooele County in this case before they do anything on their public lands. Well, they did. Is that not breaking the law? If I did that, I'd go to jail. Why don't they have some punishment? What's happened in the last 10 years, every time we needle the head person of BLM on this subject, they transfer him. Yeah. yeah. This, this is what happens when you let Washington, D.C. control two-thirds of our land. Uh, there was a great Far Side cartoon a few years ago uh, where a, a mother opens the door to her, her son's bedroom and uh, she's got like this five-year-old son. She says, Timmy, have you been playing with your hornet's nest again? There was a hornet's nest in the corner and hornets were flying all around. And, you know, the, the point being, if you put a, put a hornet's nest in there, at some point, it's going to be a problem. Um, at some point, it's going to be a problem when you let any one person or any one entity own that much land in America, own one-third of all the land mass in the United States of America, and in many Western states like ours, a, a, a substantial supermajority of the land. Um, there is no reason why they ought to own that much land. We were promised in our Statehood Enabling Act. I, I, I argue at least implicitly, some would say explicitly, that that land would be sold subsequent to statehood and 5% of the proceeds of that land would be paid into a trust fund for our public education system. Well, it never happened. Uh, but, you know, they, they made similar promises to other states that were admitted before us, like Missouri and like North Dakota. They eventually sold the land there. And look at what their economies have done. Look at what's happening in North Dakota right now. They've got a lot of oil and gas, and they're exploring it. They're developing it. Why? Because they don't have to go to their federal overseers. So uh, the question that you asked is much narrower than that. I understand that. Uh, and yet, this is yet another problem. I've seen this kind of thing happen. They, they act, and they act, and they act, and, and they get away with it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, there, are, there are those who would agree with you, and there's a great effort afoot within our state uh, and with other states, within other states to do that. Uh, Ken Ivory in our state legislature has led the charge on that. Uh, I, I believe Senator Thatcher, who's here tonight, uh, has helped him on that. And um, I salute those who have been working on that effort. For my part in Washington, I've been uh, working to persuade my colleagues uh, that the PILT program is a very good place for us to start with land reform. If they're going to own that much land, they need to pay us the rough equivalent of what the tax would be, not what they feel like paying. So this year in Tooele County, you've been hurt. Your county budget has been severely hurt because of the fact that our PILT funding, which is already way too low, is down another, what, 5 to 8 percent, and, and that's not okay. If the government had to actually pay a tax on that land to the local taxing jurisdictions, they too would see to it that they're holding too much land. Senator, Senator, I'm going to actually have you come over here. You're all sitting semi-comfortably in the room. We have a host of people outside the room, so I'm going to have you come out here and answer a question in the hall. Oh, okay. Everyone else just visualize for a moment. I'll, I'll come back, I promise. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Patty Brown, and I am from Tooele, and you were actually at my lab where I work today. I work out at Dugway Proving Ground. And... Um, I just finished a six-week furlough where I was reduced, my paycheck was reduced by 20%. I worked for 32 hours instead of 40, um, along with everybody else at Dugway and Hill Air Force Base at the, at the depot. Um, that furlough was due to the sequestration, as you know. The furlough that I had was not necessary because Dugway had enough money to pay us. We've been doing real well with our budget. That sequestration also hurt our state, our county, our schools. So what I want to know is October 1st starts our new fiscal year, and what are you doing and the other senators so that this doesn't happen again? Okay. Thank you, Patty. 
I, first of all, thank you for what you and everyone else out there at Dugway do. I've, I spent almost the entire day at Dugway Proving Grounds today, and uh, we're very lucky to have an institution, an installation like that in our state. Uh, they do a lot of great work to keep us safe, and uh, I thank you for what you do out there. Uh, so sequestration was, of course, put in place by the Budget Control Act in 2011. Uh, I'm proud to have voted against that. There were several reasons why I uh, voted against that, and one of the uh, chief reasons why I voted against it was because I could see that the, the super committee was going to fail. It was designed to fail, and that if it failed, as it did, it would result in sequestration, which would take cuts disproportionately out of our armed services spending. Now, it's not the Department of Defense that created our $17 trillion debt. And so we ought not take the $17 trillion debt problem out on the backs of hardworking men and women who serve in military and civilian capacities within uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, moreover, even once we got within sequestration, they should not have had to furlough all those people. You could do it. They could have done it uh, without any furloughs. Now, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, claims that they saved $2 billion through the furloughs of civilian employees within the Department of Defense. It's just not true. Because you, you don't save $2 billion when you defer $2 billion worth of work, work that's still going to have to be done later and is more likely to cost you more later rather than less. So this is a smoke and mirrors kind of cutting, and it's wrong. And I, on, on, on behalf of, of the United States government, of which I uh, play a part, even though I've fought this at every step of the way, I, I apologize to you for what has happened. I, I've introduced several pieces of legislation, um, uh, including two or three in the last Congress alone, that would have avoided sequestration and replaced sequestration with targeted cuts. I still hope and still expect that we can get there. So far, we have yet to pass any of those things. Even if we can't get that, even if we end up with just another continuing resolution that keeps government spending at current sequestration levels, they still don't need to do this and we still can avoid it. As a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, I have repeatedly asked Secretary Hagel and others within his chain of command uh, for a report explaining how they're going to implement uh, uh, fiscal year 2014 spending uh, in such a way that does not result in furloughs. And so I'm going to uh, keep doing that. I'm going to hold their feet to the fire any, any way I can. It is not an easy problem, but it's a problem that we're well aware of and we're trying to fix. We'll, we'll get back to that, yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, she, she was asking a question about Obamacare. Oh. We're going to get to that. I'm against it. That's just a hint. Sp <laughs> spoiler alert. Good evening, Senator. My name is Donna Jensen. I'm from Sandy. Um, I'm sure that there are as many issues. Well, there isn't a person in this room who doesn't, couldn't list all of the issues that we have problems with in this country that's destroying it. So bottom line, I'm, I'm just going to sort of cut to the chase here. We can, we can spend time admiring the issues and, and getting kind of stuck in the mud. I'm looking for solutions to the problems. And so I want to know specifically, do you or do you not support a convention of the states, not to be confused with a constitutional convention, but rather a convention of the states so that we can get this out of control federal government brought back to where it belongs. It was birthed by the states, and it's time for the states to take it back. Sounds like you've been reading Mark Levin's book. Is it? Good for you, good for you. Don, I appreciate your question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to answer you as straightforwardly as you asked me. I'm not, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting closer. Mark Levin is a close friend of mine and is a, is a mentor. I've, I've read uh, basically everything he's written over the years, and I've been talking to him over the weekend. Um, I have historically raised some concerns about the idea of um, using option two under Article 5 for uh, proposing constitutional amendments. Remember, Article 5 creates two avenues to get to a convention. Uh, through one method, uh, two-thirds of both houses of Congress propose the amendment, it becomes 
becomes valid after three-fourths of the states ratify. The other method is the one that she's referring to, uh, correct, I I in which two-thirds of the state legislatures call uh, for a convention to propose amendments. That convention then proposes amendments, and those amendments, like any others, uh, become valid after they've been ratified by three-fourths of the states. So um, we, we have 27 amendments to the Constitution currently. All 27 have been ratified through the first method, not the second. Historically, I, I've been antsy, like a lot of people, about the, the risk of a runaway convention. Mark Levin keeps assuring me the risk of that is minimized by the fact that, number one, the states could cur curtail the subject matter of the convention. Number two, uh, there's still the safety in that the state legislatures, three-fourths of them, would still have to ratify anything put forward. And so that would likely uh, mitigate, mitigate against the risk of it. You've got a follow-up question, Donna. Follow -up yeah. Wow. You're awesome. Um, how many of you think I ought to support it, the convention alternative? Anybody think I shouldn't? Okay. So the majority seems to be with you. I, I'm going to keep studying this issue. I, I, I hear you. I, I think you make some very valid points. And uh, if I can get comfortable with it, I'll do that. Thank you. Senator Lee, thank you very much for coming out here tonight and speaking with us. My name is Todd Buckner. I'm from Twilla. I spent 23 years in the United States Army, retired in 2005. Thank you. I took a couple years off, and then I decided to get back into government service. I now work at Twilla Army Depot. You talk a lot about, and I love all the comments and questions we're getting here tonight. One thing you talked about was the Budget Act talk about sequestration, none of this would have happened if we would stop the continued resolution. We need to go ahead and make the tough choice. As Republicans, you need to work with the House. They control, the Republicans control the House. You control the purse. We need to work with them and stop. If it takes a government shutdown, we need to shut the government down. We need to pass a budget. A budget. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I was a drill sergeant, so most of you probably can hear me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to know from you, will you support not allowing a continued resolution to continue going down the road, kicking the can further down the road, and if you do, will you step down from office if you go ahead and support that? Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> um... The, the short answer, well, let, let me start with this. I agree with you. Continuing resolutions are bad. I have yet to vote, I think, for a single continuing resolution since I've been there. And that's two and a half years. It's quite a few CRs. Um, I don't intend to vote for this continuing resolution um, with one exception. If I can get a continuing resolution that funds everything else in government at current levels except Obamacare, that much I'll take because we've got to defund it. CRs are bad for a whole host of reasons. Uh, Indeed. I agree. No, no, we're good. Yeah, thanks, Doug. My name is Jerry Mason, and um, my question is also in regards to sequestration. Um, I view sequestration as a result of 536 people 
in Washington, D.C. failing to do their job. Um, and it affected a certain group of people, particularly uh, DOD employees, but it did not affect the salaries of anybody in Congress or in the presidency. I am very cynical of most elected officials now. And my question to you is, what can you tell me that would convince me to vote for you next time? Okay. Um, Jerry, first of all, I'm, I'm one of only three senators who actually introduced a budget last year. Only three introduced a budget. My budget passed. If it passed, it would have balanced in five years. Um, most members of the Senate not only didn't submit a budget, didn't prepare a budget, most members of the Senate last year wouldn't even vote for a budget. Not a single one. So not only would they present one, but they wouldn't vote for any either because they didn't want their name on anything. They just didn't like it. They were comfortable with the CR. And so um, uh, I, I, I have put things forward in order to try to save it. I've put two or three different pieces of legislation that would have avoided sequestration altogether and replaced it with something else. I was the author of Cut, Cap, and Balance in 2011, which would have avoided the need for sequestration in the very first instance. Uh, in, it would have been instead of the Budget Control Act, and it would have said, okay, uh, we can raise the debt limit to the extent necessary to keep government operating, but only, uh, only after we have first adopted a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. And that's really what we need to fix the problem, because the problem in Washington is that the political elite ruling class, people in both parties, and unfortunately, my party has been just as much of an offender as the other, have voted again and again and again blindly to raise the debt limit without thinking about what that's doing to our ability to run government. Now, what's the one thing that only the federal government can do? National defense. That's the one thing that we're supposed to be doing, the one thing that's really, really clear that, that we can do and that we must do. Um, a couple years ago, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, you know what our number one threat to national security is? Our debt. That's because it brings about things like sequestration. It brings about a set of economic circumstances in which we won't be able to fund anything, including defense. And so I've, I'm proposing solutions. Those solutions have yet to be accepted by the political ruling class in both parties. But with your help and the help of other people like you, uh, we can get there. It's going to take some time, but we'll get there. No budget. You don't deserve our taxes. Yeah. Senator Lee, my name's John Julian. I'm from Tooele here. And it's nice to talk to you again. I talked to you last month, I think it was. Um, my question is on the border. I grew up in Arizona. I remember after Reagan had given amnesty to people, I lived by the railroad track, and I saw them on the railroad track coming all the time. They'd stop the tra train, they'd jump off, they were gone. Um, we have laws in effect right now that we're supposed to secure that border. You talked about the national security, that is one of the highest security to me threats right now is the border. It's not secure. We're supposed to have fences that are built. We're cutting back on our patrol agents down there and we're handcuffing them. What do you think needs to happen and what will you do to make it happen and secure our borders? Okay. So John, it's John, right? One of the first things we need to do is unlock their capacity to enforce the border even on lands that have been designated as environmentally sensitive. Um, yeah. <laughs> Protecting the environment's a great thing, but nobody has ever thought that that was a good idea to say, well, we'll just relinquish the border in those areas where our border patrol officers might have to walk across a protected uh, a parcel of land. And yet there's a substantial uh, segment of the border where uh, our, our border patrol agents are not allowed to do their job for that very reason. Rob Bishop has legislation uh, to fixing that problem. I wholeheartedly support it. Uh, that's one of the first places where we've got to start. Um, 
I, I, I want to speak briefly to the Gang of Eight immigration bill because that always comes up anytime we talk about immigration. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly support immigration reform. If you believe we need immigration reform, you should also believe that uh, the Gang of Eight bill was a mistake because the Gang of Eight bill will make immigration reform impossible. The Gang of Eight bill, I believe, was designed to fail, just, just like the Budget Control Act. It was designed to fail in the House of Representatives. It was designed not to produce an actual reform because they inserted the one thing that is the most controversial of, of everything else in the field of immigration reform, which is amnesty, a virtually certain pathway to citizenship for all the 11 million people who are here illegally, making no distinction whatsoever between those who have come here illegally and those who overstayed their visa, perhaps uh, uh, under innocent circumstances, making no distinction between the age at which they came here. Just saying, if you're here illegally as of a certain date, you're going to become a citizen eventually. And uh, uh, that was wrong. Another reason why that thing was wrong was a thousand pages long uh, by the time it came up. We spent months combing through this thing. I sat on the Judiciary Committee. We spent weeks of markup. I personally introduced dozens of amendments to it. Um, most of them didn't pass because the Gang of Eight and the Democrats blocked most of the amendments designed to improve it. Um, but at, at the end of all that process, you know what they did? The night before we started voting on it, on the floor of the Senate, after it left committee, the night before, they switched out the 1,000-page bill and they replaced it with a 1,200-page bill. Yet another circumstance in which senator after senator voted for it without ever having read the whole thing, and that's disgraceful. Okay. All right, so first we've got to pass the Bishop bill that I described a minute ago, allowing the enforcement along the border. Secondly, um, we, we do need to increase the boots, the number of boots on the ground along the border. I don't know what the magic number is. Some have said 2,000, some have said 3,000. I don't know. I'm not necessarily sure it matters the exact number. I do tend to agree with what my friend Ted Cruz said, which is maybe the solution is we ought to shut down the IRS, send all the IRS agents to the border. <laughs> Okay, um, Senator Lee. Hi, I'm Valerie Ackley from Saratoga Springs. And I have been very dismayed the last couple of weeks listening to the media, people like Mitt Romney, people like Orrin Hatch, Doug Wright, <laughs> make negative comments about your goal to defund Obamacare. I think it sounds brilliant. I'm wondering, in your opinion, why are they so unconfident that this is possible? And what kind of steps do you go through to try to convince other senators that this is possible, that it can be done? Thank you, Valerie. Um, I'm really glad you brought this uh, up because if you might have noticed, I've talked about this a uh, fair amount lately, and this is an issue that's important to me. Um, like you, I've been really disappointed uh, at the fact that liberals in both political parties have been quick to criticize this plan to stop Obamacare. And yet many of those liberals in both political parties who have been quick to criticize it have nothing to suggest as to how we can stop it. This is a law that, make no mistake, will make health care more expensive for basically everyone in this room. This is a law that, make no mistake, will result in people losing their jobs. It'll result in people having their hours cut. It, it, it already has, and I hear new examples of this every single day from employers throughout our state, from one end to the other, and across America. This is a law that the president has said he's not going to enforce, and if he's not going to enforce it as it's written, I see no reason why we should fund it. It was passed without a single Republican vote. If they didn't need Republican votes to pass it, why should they need Republican votes to fund it? So. But getting to your question. I can't speak to any individual, uh, any of the individuals that you mentioned or, or anyone else. They will have to speak for themselves as to why they feel the way they, they feel. I wasn't there in New Hampshire when somebody asked Mitt Romney the, the question that they supposedly asked him. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the question actually asked him was, do you think a government shutdown is a good idea? And he probably said, no, a government shutdown is not a good idea because it's probably not. The point is, uh, people are couching this wrong. 
I, I've, I haven't called for a shutdown. I don't want a shutdown. We don't need a shutdown. In fact, what I'm proposing is a way to avoid a shutdown. What I'm saying is that Obamacare needs to be funded or not funded on its own merits and not on the merits of Social Security and not on the merits of national defense. What those people who are claiming I'm calling for a shutdown are really saying is they're saying unless we are willing to fund Obamacare, they're not willing to fund armed services. That's immoral and we have to call them out on that and we have to beat them. Senator Lee, uh, Robert Smith from Stansbury Park here in, in Tooele County. Um, we're on the uh, precipice of a, con a conflagration in the Middle East. Can you articulate what our national interests are in Syria? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, so, uh, Robert. The Middle East is a mess, there's, there's no question about it. Um, Mr. Assad does not appear to be a nice guy. Never met him, probably never will, but he does not appear to be a nice guy. And my heart goes out to the poor people of Syria who have suffered for a long time. Uh, and uh, many of whom have suffered in the very, very recent uh, past. But as I look at that situation, even though I can see how there are things that could happen in Syria and spill out from Syria that could end up impacting U.S. national security. I, I, I understand how there could be an indirect uh, or, or even some direct uh, impact on U.S. national security based on what happens in Syria. I have no idea how we get involved there uh, when we don't know what victory looks like. When we don't know if, in fact, we were to assist in toppling Assad, who would take over? And would the guy or the group of guys, sorry, it, it always is guys in that part of the world, um, would those people be any less hostile to us than Mr. Assad? I, I've been briefed about it. I've received a, a lot of briefings, some of which are classified, and I can tell you, I'm not convinced that we'd be any better off with who would take over in Assad's absence than Assad. So in the meantime, I, I say, Mr. President, if you want to go to war, first of all, you darn well better consult Congress and get a, an act of war passed by Congress first. <laughs> he, sh he shouldn't be going to war without a declaration of war. Uh, when, he, when he puts our brave men and women in harm's way uh, and, and goes to war, he needs to get a declaration of war from Congress. Number two, if he's going to get my vote, he's got to be able to articulate a few things. What does a victory look like? Why is this in our national security interest, and how will a post-Assad Syria be better for U.S. national security than the status quo? All right, we have gone past our hour, and I know there's a lot more questions out there. Uh, so what we're going to what we're going to do is I'm going to have the senator uh, make some final comments, and then the senator is going to hang around for a little while. And then we also have uh, senior staff here uh, from around the state and from Washington, uh, so we can answer some of those questions as well. For those of you who want to hang around and uh, uh, and come up and chat with the senator, uh, we'll try to keep that moving along as well. If you just want to shake hands and move through, uh, we'll try to keep that rolling along. Uh, but we really appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, this is the, the most important thing, and this is, this is where things happen uh, live on the ground. And so we appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, we appreciate all that you do. And uh, like I said, the senator will stay after, and the staff will be around to answer any questions or help with any uh, things that you might need. So with that, Senator, we'll give you the last word. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Uh, as Boyd pointed out, uh, the fact that this many of you would come out on a perfectly good uh, Tuesday night uh, speaks well of this community and the fact that you care enough about this country to come and and um, and, and speak with a, 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 a really boring guy who spends some time in Washington. Um, I, I'm honored to serve you in Washington. It's a privilege to um, serve and to represent this greatest state of the, in the Union, which I firmly believe that Utah is. I want to end uh, by wrapping back up with where we started. What has always made America great is its status as the land of opportunity. And I want to make sure that it always is. I want to make sure that regardless of where you are on the ladder, the government isn't interfering. The government isn't acting where it should not be. 
that if you're at the bottom end of the ladder or in the middle and you're just trying to work your way up, the government should stay out, which means its regulatory and tax impact ought to be minimal and that it ought not interfere in your lives. It ought not be targeting you or spying on you uh, or lying to you. Uh, your government needs to shoot straight with you. The government ought not be favoring those at the top end of the ladder. It ought not be engaging in crony capitalism. And all of these things tend to happen. They all tend to become problems when government gets too big, when it loses its moorings. We've known from the time of the American Revolution that uh, there was a real risk in big government, especially at the national level. It was for that reason that we had the, the Revolutionary War. It wasn't just because we were tired of speaking with a British accent, although I'm sure that got old. Um, <laughs> it wasn't just that we were sick of had a, having a king, but you know that was a drag too. It, it was about the fact that we were subject to a large, distant national government, one that taxed us too much and regulated us too heavily, one that was so far from the people that it was slow to respond to the needs of the people. And uh, you know, we, our, our war of independence was hard fought, and we put in place a limited purpose national government to replace our old London-based national government, one that would be in charge of just a few basic things, one that would stay out of your way so that you can do what you do best, which is work hard to move up that ladder so that you can provide for the needs of your family and so that y you can live the life that you want to live rather than the one that the government happens to dictate to you. We need to return to those founding era principles. Fortunately, we have the ability to return to those and to restore limited government at the national level without a, 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 a war because that war has already been fought. It's already been won several times, in fact. What we need to do is just change the way we vote. What we need to do is just change what we demand from our elected representatives, that we want limited government, that we want Washington to let most decisions be made at the appropriate level, state level, the local level, and most important, the individual and family level. That's what I'm about. And that's why I'm fighting against Obamacare, because Obamacare wants to expand government. Obamacare is going to put government directly into your lives in a way that it never, ever has been before. And if you think we can't afford our current health care system, and you'd be well within your right to say that we can't, I ask the following question. Do you think we can any more afford our current health care system with a massive, unprecedented government bureaucracy on top of it? I think not. And I think the American people deserve better than to have this law thrust upon them, one that was never read by members of Congress, who passed it, one that was amended not just once but twice by the Supreme Court, a majority of the court found that it was unconstitutional as written, they rewrote it twice in order to save it, in order to avoid having to do the difficult but right thing of finding it unconstitutional, and that was wrong. The president has amended it at least three times, saying he won't follow the law as written. And if that's the case, then Congress must exercise its power of the purse, and it must defund Obamacare. For those of you who agree with me, I invite you to join me in this cause. I invite you to join me in a civil but robust dialogue with your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues. Most importantly, with your elected representatives in government and with the press. The press, which for reasons that astound and confound and dismay and disgust me, the press continues to be the lapdog of the governing class in Washington. The press continues to message falsely, wrongly, ignorantly, that this is a shutdown threat, which it is not. This is an attempt to restore constitutionally limited government. This is an attempt to restore freedom. This is an attempt to save our health and our health care system and our economy. Join with me. Together we can make it happen. We can and we must, and together we will. Thank you very much. <laughs>